today on Straight Talk Africa, Nigerians have spoken in favor of democratic change. Could this mean the end of one-man rule and hence the beginning of governments that reflect the will of the people? That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, April 8th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. Happy Wednesday, everybody. I'm Maria Madialo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about what some observers say democracy was the real winner in last week's Nigerian presidential election and what this could mean for the rest of the continent. And coming up later in our STA inbox, we'll share some of the thoughts we've received on our topic through emails, Twitter, and Facebook comments. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, the recent Nigerian peaceful presidential and parliamentary elections are widely seen as a triumph for democracy. In the eyes of many, the significance and symbolism of Muhammad Buhari's historic victory should not be underestimated. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. You voted for change, and now change has come. The handover of power from President Goodluck Jonathan to President-elect Muhammadu Buhari is seen as an historic milestone for Nigeria and Africa. More than 55 million Nigerians, many waiting hours, even days, voted in the election. There were glitches, delays, disturbances, and some violence. But the near-unanimous conclusion is that the poll was the most free, fair, and transparent election in Nigeria's history. The big winner was democracy. For the first time in Nigeria, an incumbent president and ruling party was defeated by the voters. This is the first time in Nigeria that uh, a sitting government would be voted out of power using purely democratic means. Uh, before now, when uh, governments are not popular, they either sit tight or they are removed by the military. President Goodluck Jonathan's swift and graceful concession allowed the nation to quickly heal from a hard-fought campaign. I promise the country free and fair elections. I've kept my word. I've also expanded the space for Nigerians to participate in the democratic process. President-elect Buhari wasted no time in uniting the country. Our country has now joined community of nations that have used the ballot box to peacefully change an incumbent president in a free, fair election. To me, this is indeed historic. Nigeria appears to have emerged from the historic poll as a stronger nation. The Independent National Electoral Commission's Aturo Yega survived as chairman despite efforts to remove him days before the postponed vote. Biometric voter cards and fingerprint scanners were introduced, and where there were problems and glitches, they were handled peacefully and efficiently. Chairman Jaga says INEC will continue its investigations of all complaints until they are resolved, as the commission works to improve the system and the process. Former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria John Campbell also praised the vote. Social media has played uh, an extremely positive role, along with various uh, civil organizations in Nigeria, to mobilize support for democratic methods and approaches. Social media is also acting as a kind of watchdog, uh, and it's not afraid to point out, how shall we put it diplomatically, irregularities. Many international observers are hoping voters, civil society, and government leaders across Africa will follow the example set by the proud Nigerian electorate and hold peaceful polls and violence-free transitions of power. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Um, now, joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests, Ambassador Johnny Carson, 
former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. He currently serves as senior advisor to the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, an partisan independent federal institution that works to prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflicts around the world. And Dr. Christopher Formigno, a native of Cameroon, serves as the senior associate and regional director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute, or NDI, a non-profit, non-partisan organization working to support and strengthen democratic institutions worldwide. Well, I have to say, frankly, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you one more time on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you're, you. You're most Thank welcome, sir. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. This country code is one. But before we begin today's discussion, let's go to the Nigerian capital, Abuja, and talk with Professor Atahiri Jega, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission. He joins us via a telephone link-up from INEC headquarters in Abuja. Good evening, Professor Jega. Good evening, uh, Shaka Sali. Thank you for having me on this program. Well, thank you very much for coming. Frankly, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Are you there? Hello? Yes, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Yes, talk to us about uh, how you were able to do this, really. You pulled off an incredible job here. We're talking about a country which attained independence October 1, 1960. But this, apparently, according to many observers, has never, has never been done. What was the secret behind your success? Well, um, uh, we thank God that we were given the opportunity to contribute to deepening democracy in our country, and we gave it our best. Uh, basically, we planned well, and we got tremendous support and encouragement from Nigerians and from friends. Uh, and uh, we were able to develop a strategic plan and to follow it, uh, and to also introduce some innovative measures that we believed could uh, improve the integrity of the process. And thank God, everything seems to have worked well. Of course, there were challenges. It wasn't perfect, but uh, we are pleased that the outcome has been generally uh, appreciated. Talking about introducing some innovating, innovative measures, uh, what specifically did you do in order to make sure that uh, coalition officers could not inflate or deflate figures or succeed at what some would call, you know, to attain creative accounting? Um, the, the first thing we did was to review the uh, method of appointing coalition officers. Uh, previous, in previous elections before 2011, uh, staff of INEC, permanent staff of INEC, were responsible for collating and uh, returning the method, and we appointed uh, people outside of INEC, in particular from the universities. And uh, the role of these uh, independent uh, persons of integrity actually has helped in the transparency of the process, as well as in ensuring that INEC staff are insulated uh, from uh, controversies associated with election results. But we also introduced what we call a permanent voters card, uh, which is uh, a card with a microchip that contains all the details of a voter. And we used a card reader uh, to verify the card and establish that it was issued by INEC, as well as authenticate the voter uh, through biometric means in particular uh, uh, scanning the fingerprint of the voter. Uh, by doing this, we were able to eliminate uh, quite a substantial 
uh, uh, areas of uh, irregularity in the history of our electoral processes. And uh, generally, Nigerians have accepted this, and uh, it has helped remarkably uh, in, in uh, uh, the 2015 general elections. Now, we know, of course, that uh, professionally you were a university professor and that at one time you served as a vice chancellor for a university. To what extent uh, did this become a factor, especially when it came to choosing coalition officers? Because it seemed to me that uh, everyone was a professor and a vice chancellor of a Nigerian university. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, in 2011, when we decided to change the methodology of appointing returning officers, uh, I, we used a constituency uh, with which I was well familiar with. Uh, having been a professor and a vice chancellor, I knew that many vice chancellors and professors are passionate about reforming the electoral process and uh, uh, can bring tremendous uh, uh, value uh, to the system. And uh, we approached the committee of vice chancellors and the individual vice chancellors, and they were all willing to serve. And they served with integrity in the 2011 general elections, which also made us now to invite them once again. And uh, we are all pleased that they have done us proud as uh, uh, members of the academia. They, are, they have really done this work very dispassionately, uh, very transparently, and with tremendous integrity. And we really thank them and appreciate their contribution to this uh, uh, outcome. Talk to us about uh, an incident uh, that nearly uh, brought problems during the tallying of the votes. And we're talking about uh, a gentleman by the name Godsde Orubebe, a former cabinet minister, and senior supporter of the ruling PDP who screamed and hurled abuses at you, Professor Jagger? Um, well, uh, I, I don't think we should belabor the point. I, I think for some reason he was not uh, pleased with the way things were out and uh, evidently couldn't control himself. Um, but uh, I understand he has since apologized, and I think there is no need to belabor the point. I think the most important thing for all of us is that when it comes to handling uh, issues of national importance, that we need to remain calm and composed and to be focused in terms of the, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, at all times we put the interest of the nation ahead of us. And that's what we try to do, and we thank God that uh, it turned out well. What about some people who have been saying that uh, you are a very exceptional individual because you must have stood um, against, frankly, a lot of pressure? Uh, we know, of course, that uh, you generally used to talk about how you had not been pressured by anybody. But if you were to talk to us from the deepest, better part of the bottom of your Nigerian heart and soul, were you at any one time pressured by anybody uh, to do things that you'd not have liked to do, Professor Jagger? Um, I must say that perhaps the only uh, pressure that we came under as an electoral commission was the pressure to meet our own goals, define goals under the deadlines that we have uh, set uh, for having credible elections. Uh, other than that, I personally have not come under any pressure from any person uh, if pressure is interpreted to get us to do something uh, unwholesome or, uh, or unacceptable. What about uh, the uh, postponement of the election from uh, February 14 to March 28th? There are some people, frankly, who did not buy the reason given uh, by the Nigerian government. They say, in fact, it was an excuse. It was not a security problem, but rather a political problem, uh, which was meant to allow some period so the ruling party uh, could pick up itself and figure out a way uh, of making sure that uh, it stays in power. Well, um, as far as the 
Independent National Electoral Commission was concerned, we received a, a request, or rather a strong advice from the military authorities through the National Security Advisor uh, on the need to postpone the elections for about six weeks uh, in order for them to be able to improve the security situation in the country, but especially in the uh, northeast uh, geopolitical zone, which uh, has been affected by insurgency. And um, when they told us that they could not guarantee security, uh, and we knew that we were going to deploy almost uh, 700,000 uh, electoral workers nationwide, we had to think seriously about making such a huge deployment when security could not be guaranteed. So we accepted it in good faith, and um, we are glad that the six weeks extension also afforded us an opportunity to further refine our processes and improve uh, uh, the integrity of the electoral process. Final question, Professor Jega. Do you have any particular individual that you regard as your hero? Is there someone that was able to provide you with their shoulders in order for you to climb on them so as to see a little bit further? Um, absolutely. There are so many people on whose uh, shoulders I had uh, climbed, uh, to put it uh, in, in your words, uh, but they are so numerous for me to, to begin to mention them. All I want to say here is that I appreciate the tremendous support and the encouragement I have got from many Nigerians and many other uh, uh, friends and uh, uh, inspiring leaders uh, all over the world who have supported us and encouraged us and assisted us to do our best for our country. I really appreciate it. The time will come, uh, I believe, when I will begin to mention them individually. Congratulations, sir. Thank you so very much, Sakasali. I appreciate this. Thank you, too. The feeling is mutual. Let's stop right there. I'd like to take this opportunity, of course, to thank INEC Chairman Professor Jega for sharing his perspective with us today. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter. And we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Democracy Wins. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa, become a fan, and connect with the other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. Let's take a quick look at some incumbent African presidents who conceded defeat after an election. Let's go to Nigeria, where after losing the March 28th election, incumbent President Goodluck Jonathan conceded defeat to Muhammadu Buhari to become the first sitting Nigerian president to be unseated at the ballot box. His People's Democratic Party has run Nigeria since the end of military rule in 1999. Now to Zambia, where Rupia Banda was defeated by Michael Sata in September 2011. In his concession speech, he noted that the people of Zambia had spoken through the democratic process and there was the need to obey it. In March 2012, Senegalese President Abdoulaye Wad was defeated by Macky Sall in a runoff election despite winning constitutional permission to run three times. He conceded defeat after being beaten by a wide margin. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question.
keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa. We are talking about how some observers say democracy was the real winner in the Nigerian presidential election and what it could mean for the rest of the continent. With us today is Ambassador Johnny Carson, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, and Dr. Christopher Fomino, a native of Cameroon, who serves as the Senior Associate and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute. Well, gentlemen, once again, of course, uh, it's always a pleasure, really, hosting you on Straight Talk Africa. Pleased to be here with you, Shaka. And luckily, of course, uh, you were both in Nigeria. Yes. yes we Walk were. us through some of your experiences. How did it feel like, really, when you finally got the results and you know what? You have a new president. Let me say that uh, everyone in Nigeria should be pleased and proud of the process. Uh, it was uh, well run, uh, a uh, peaceful, uh, orderly, uh, and uh, the outcome reflected, uh, I believe, the will of the Nigerian uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone uh, should be proud of the professionalism, the integrity uh, that uh, INEC brought to the process, and especially the leadership uh, under Professor Jega. Uh, so I think uh, Nigerians have much to be uh, proud of uh, uh, with respect to the outcome of these elections. What about you, uh, Chris? Uh, how did you see it from your vantage point? Well, I must say that um, you're right, that democracy is the winner. Uh, but this is one of those uh, instances where democracy has got many twin brothers and twin sisters. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in this particular case, it's the Nigerian people that really came out victorious of this because the Nigerian people have worked so hard in the past two decades to really put in place a democratic system and to strengthen their democratic processes and institutions. And I think what we've seen now in March 2015 mm -hmm. was a culmination of all of these efforts. They've had elections in the past. Some elections have been good. Some have not been so good. They've had elections in the past where there was violence. And, uh, you know, the country itself was going through a very difficult experience on issues of insecurity, especially in the Northeast with the Boko Haram insurgency. And to go through this election, uh, which was really peaceful, and to have no violence and to have the election results announced in a very transparent, open forum, state by state, and to have the incumbent president pick up the phone and congratulate his opposition or his opponent, was something very uplifting for the Nigerian people. And I'm hoping that they should be celebrating this victory for themselves and for Africa as a continent. It is very interesting that uh, you keep saying they have had elections. There are a lot of people, frankly, who will not agree with you. They will say since October 1st, 1960. This may very well be the only elections, frankly, that Nigerians have ever, in fact, participated in because the other ones, they will tell you, were selections. How do you react to that, especially given that you come from next door in Cameroon? Well, I think uh, when many Cameroonians look at what is happening in Nigeria, they see a country in which people are really committed um, to, the, to democracy and to the practices of democracy. Uh, and they see that that commitment can pay off over time, can pay off over time. It's true, some of the elections have been controversial in Nigerian's history. For example, the elections in 2007 were considered to be the worst in Nigerian history uh, because election results were being announced at a time when coalition was still taking place in some of the states. Uh, but we must admit that even in 2011, um, under the chairmanship of uh, Professor Ateheru Jega, when he became the chairman of the election commission, mm. we began to see a shift a, a, a very dramatic shift in the way in which elections were being conducted in Nigeria. And that the 2011 elections, which were his first election as chairman of the election commission, were credible, were very fair and very open, and people didn't contest the elections, even though in the post-election period there was some violence. And that the state elections that followed 2011 were conducted in a very inclusive and open manner. So we see Nigeria on a, a positive trajectory and we're hopeful that these gains will be consolidated 
and there will be no space for any rollback um, in terms of future elections in Nigeria. Ambassador Kasson, what about you? There are some who will tell you that uh, the only election before this one, really, uh, that came to almost uh, uh, meet the threshold, really, was that one of June 12, 1993, which was apparently won by then multi-billionaire Mashrud Abiyora and honored by then General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, now retired, but perhaps not tired, really. Let me say everyone remembers the importance and the significance of that election, and it was a good election that was annulled uh, by the military. But uh, Chris is absolutely right. I think the turning point uh, was the election of 2007 uh, under the uh, poor leadership of Maurice Iwu. Mm -hmm. Uh, everyone uh, Professor, believes, by the way, also. Yes, mm. but I think that uh, his administration uh, of that uh, election was one of the uh, worst uh, in Nigeria's uh, history. Uh, as Chris pointed out, uh, ballots uh, uh, never uh, were counted in some places, and returns uh, were uh, sent in in places where people never voted. <laughs> Uh, the departure of Maurice Iwu as election commissioner and the appointment of Professor Jega to replace him mm. was a historic moment uh, in the INEC uh, history. Uh, and it's been an historic moment in elections as well. Uh, the uh, 2011 uh, elections, which I also had an opportunity to observe, uh, were significantly better than the uh, uh, 2003 election. Mm -hmm. And the 2015 uh, elections constitute an uh, improvement over 2011. And this, uh, despite uh, what many thought would be uh, a very uh, difficult, hotly contested, and probably a violence-prone election. None of that happened. It's a tribute to the people of Nigeria. A tribute to the people of Nigeria, indeed, and of course, the impeccable credentials of Professor Jekyll. How about that? Uh, I think that uh, many people uh, across Nigeria and in the democratic community need to applaud his integrity, his professionalism, uh, and his focus. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that he said uh, that he uh, was not pressured, uh, I am sure uh, there were lots of uh, moments uh, that were tense moments for, for him as he prepared for this, uh, this very high-stakes election. What about uh, supporters uh, of Professor Goodluck, uh, uh, Jonathan Iberi? We have reports, for, for example, from uh, uh, Port Harcourt, uh, which is, of course, in the Niger Delta. Uh, there is uh, a waitress who was quoted as saying, Good luck is a stupid man for conceding, a disappointment for Nigeria. What about that? And apparently there were a lot of people. Did you run in any of people who thought like that? Well, I must say that, you know, in a competitive election, um, sometimes uh, not everybody gets to the same place at the same time. And that because this election could go either way, it could have been won by either candidate, that their supporters really believed that their candidates would win. Mm. And so it, it takes a while for the message to sink in to all of the supporters that the election is over, their candidate has considered, and that the country as a whole stands to gain from not undermining the outcome of that election. So I wouldn't, in a country of um, 160 million people, uh, 69 million people on the voter rolls, um, 150,000 polling units um, all across the country. I wouldn't really put a lot of weight to what is said by one uh, voter under those circumstances. I should also add, in terms of Pro Professor Jega, uh, one of the factors that really contributed to his success and why he's such an admirable gentleman is that his patriotism was really on the line. He put it out there and he held mm -hmm. strong to it, even when he came under criticism or under pressure from people who wanted to undermine his work. And lastly, his humility. Um, you, what you saw or listened to is what you get. With Professor Jager, very humble, not full of himself, always open to advice. The recommendations that were made 
after the 2011 elections he took to heart and he took steps to strengthen the process so that 2015 would be better over 2011. Thank He's you. a great individual and a great human being. Unfortunately, the time happens not to be a best ally. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, but first here is Maria Majaro. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the fantastic and quite hopeful comments on the future of democracy in Africa. But for now, here is our letter of the week. Mohamed Ahmed Mansour from Monrovia in Liberia writes, I would like to congratulate President Goodluck Jonathan, Mohamed Buhari, and the people of Nigeria for their commitment to a peaceful, free, fair, and transparent election. I feel very excited by the level of political maturity exhibited by the people of Nigeria. I hope other African countries will follow their example. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to keep your questions brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. President-elect Mohamedou Buhari's victory has shed new light on Nigeria and its democratic process. Political observers across Africa and the world say that democracy emerged as the true winner of the election as the country embarks on its first peaceful handover of power since the end of military rule in 1999. This leads us to our question of the week asking, what can African countries learn from Nigeria's presidential election in order to conduct elections that will reflect the will of the people? Well, thanks for using all our social media platform to tell us what you think. Let's begin with a comment from Austin Ewa Eko in Lagos, Nigeria, who writes, Africans should learn to play politics with a great sense of responsibility. Africa's politicians must also learn that no one's personal political ambition should cause blood to be spilled. And above all, actual power belongs to the people and not the politicians. Well, another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA Democracy Wins. And if you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. Speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from Emeka Ulor, who writes, the Nigerian elections show that free, fair, and acceptance of defeat fosters peace. Thanks, Emeka, for your tweet. And now let's take uh, another look of, a look of another tweet, uh, this time from Mata, uh, Carlo Mata, who says, Nigeria has become an example to where Africa should be heading. Well, Shaka and guess your thoughts on uh, these comments. How do you respond to that, uh, Johnny? Uh, I think that the Nigerian elections demonstrate clearly that democracy is desired uh, across Africa and that the democratic trajectory has not fallen back, has not plateaued, and has in fact continued to, to move forward. Uh, what we saw uh, in Nigeria uh, was uh, Africa's uh, arguably most important country, its most populous country, uh, the country on the continent with the largest uh, economy. Uh, demonstrating a strong commitment uh, to democratic values uh, and principles. 
uh, a nation uh, in excess of 170 million people voting uh, clearly for democracy, demonstrating uh, that Africa's largest nations, its most important nation, is committed to uh, democratic uh, progress. But this only underscores, I believe, what has been happening around the continent with very little attention and notice from the outside world. Mm -hmm. Over the last six months, we have seen democratic progress uh, in the form of sound elections and transfers of power uh, in Mozambique, in Malawi, in Zambia, in Namibia, where the former president just won for the first time in five years uh, the Mo Ibrahim Prize for Good Governance. In all of those states, we have seen leaders, some of them term limited, step down. We have also seen other limits, leaders who have not been term limited, defeated, but step down peacefully. We have seen vice presidents succeed uh, uh, presidents. Uh, but those are not just the only cases that are mm -hmm. out there. If you look back over the last year, we've seen successful uh, elections in places like Mauritius, where we've seen governments change hands. We've seen democracy return strongly to Madagascar, where it had been stalled for a number of years. And I think uh, not enough attention is given to the progression of democracy across uh, the continent. Clearly, there are places uh, where conflicts continue and where democracy uh, has not uh, been allowed uh, to move forward. Uh, but if you look at the countries, the 48 countries that are a part of sub-Saharan Africa, I think those elections uh, in Nigeria demonstrate uh, that there is still a strong desire on the part of people uh, mm -hmm. to embrace democracy to elect their leaders, and to live under constitutional multi-party systems. And I think not enough attention is given to that. Uh, Nigeria's people uh, deserve uh, credit for this, uh, and it is credit, I think, that continues to uh, grow. Thank you very much. Uh, Mariam, uh, please share some more of our audience feedback with us. Well, we'll move on to a posting from Caroline Nawa in Lusaka, Zambia, who writes that African countries should learn that their electoral commissions should be independent and free from interference. Democracy is the rule of the people, by the people, and for the people. Let's take a look at another Facebook comment from Mualimu Tahakabar Shahid from Kampala in Uganda, who posted this on our wall, that Africans should understand that love for their nation is bigger than anything. Nigerians voted for their country, not for a tribe and not for religious reasons. Very pertinent comments. Shaka and Guess, once again, what do you make of these words? Very interesting, uh, Chris. Very interesting indeed. And I'm glad that Africans across the continent were paying so much attention to the Nigerian elections and are inculcating uh, the, the, the points, the pointers coming out of Nigeria into the local discourse in their respective countries. Uh, I think the message coming out of Nigeria is strong, it's powerful. It also should underscore the efforts that were put into these elections by the Nigerian people, uh, some of which may not really have gotten a lot of coverage internationally. Mm. I'm thinking about the work that was done by Nigerian civil society organizations, women's groups, human rights organizations at the grassroots level to, to talk about civic education and voter education to remind the, the electorate mm. to come out and vote and cast their ballots, but also to remember that peaceful participation was essential to a strong democratic uh, process. I'm thinking about the National Peace Committee, which was set up by Nigerians that brought together religious leaders across uh, different faiths, mm. Muslim, Christian, together under the leadership of uh, former uh, head of state, uh, Abu Bakr Abdul Salami. Uh, to, to talk about peace and to serve as a, a neutral platform of discussions and interactions amongst the main contenders. This was the national, uh, the Nigerian Peace Council right. that initiated the Abuja Accords that were signed in January, at which point all of the parties committed 
to going through a peaceful process and to getting their supporters to abide by the Abuja Accords. Yeah. And a few days before election day, on March 26th, two days before election day, Ambassador Carson and I were in Abuja and we saw Jonathan and Buhari coming together to sign, to re-sign and recommit to the Abuja Accords. This was a Nigerian-grown initiative. And then, of course, there was a transition monitoring group, uh, a coalition of over 460 civil society organizations that deployed over 4,000 observers across all of Nigerians, 36 states, and all of the local government areas, and that conducted a quick count, a parallel vote tabulation process by mm. which they were able to track the election returns from the polling units through the states into the federal capital of Abuja. I mean, these are magnificent efforts by Nigerians that other Africans should emulate and learn from. And I think it's that cross-fertilization of experiences and expertise that would help keep democracy on the right trajectory across our continent. Very briefly, you mentioned, of course, uh, the role played by uh, General Abu Salami, the man that succeeded, of course, uh, General Sane Abacha. Uh, have you heard the reports that uh, he actually did persuade good luck Jonathan Ebede to make that almighty telephone call to General Buhari? Well, I am not <laughs> privy to, to those conversations, but I think that a lot of uh, Nigerians deserve credit for it. And knowing General uh, Ab uh, Abubakar Abdul Salami as I do, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he went that extra mile to make sure that the, con the, the contestants could acknowledge the voice of the Nigerian people and comport themselves in a way that would strengthen Nigeria as a country and strengthen the democratic process there. Very interesting. Thanks, Mariema, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that will do it for today's social media segment. Uh, thanks to Chris and, of course, Ambassador Carson for responding to our audience. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. Or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa. And follow us on Twitter. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, we look at terrorism on the continent. Recently, Al-Shabaab militants massacred nearly 150 university students in Kenya. But while African coalition forces show signs of defeating Boko Haram in northeastern Nigeria, some wonder, is Africa's war on terrorism winnable? We'll discuss that and more next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. And let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Uh, good evening, Stephen from Tanzania. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Hey, I'm Stephen from uh, Tanzania. Uh, I appreciate to with a uh, uh, gratitude for you strengthening this video, uh, this uh, program. Profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled for your compliments, Ndugu Stephen. What is your question? Okay, my question was, uh, 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 what is your focus to, 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 to still facilitate strengthening the democracy in, 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 in Africa and uh, uh, the world as well? Because I see uh, the program has been very, very, very potential for people to understand how democracy is working in Africa and the world as well. And, and world as well. Thank you very much. Uh, what about that, uh, Ambassador Carson? I know that in the past, of course, you've talked about uh, how democracy has been depending uh, in several parts uh, of uh, the continent, in particular Southern Africa. But someone will tell you, when you add the numbers in all those countries that you mentioned, they don't come anywhere to Nigeria because there will just be a few states, really, when it comes to Nigeria. Because the last time I checked, one out of every four sub-Saharan African may in fact be a Nigerian. Well, let me say, I think that uh, we have seen an enormous amount of uh, democratic process and progress uh, over the last uh, 20 years. 
and Nigeria is an example of the continuation of that progress. In addition, uh, I mentioned a number of states uh, that have uh, adopted uh, uh, democratic uh, constitutional uh, regimes and are moving forward. Mm. But I think at the, at the heart of all of this is civil uh, and public participation in the democratic process. Mm-hmm. Uh, constitutions uh, that are put in place uh, that are strong uh, and provide strong institutions, independent institutions, uh, presidential term limitations, uh, uh, strong and independent uh, uh, legislatures, strong and independent uh, judiciaries, uh, space uh, for uh, civil society to uh, participate uh, and to hold its leaders uh, accountable. Uh, it is absolutely uh, important also for these societies to have free and open uh, media. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's important uh, for them to permit freedom of association, uh, to allow them to organize civil society uh, groupings, whether they are labor unions, whether they are teachers unions, or mm-hmm. whether they are uh, unions, unions or organizations that re- represent uh, s- citizens in other ways. But all of this uh, helps to strengthen the the democratic process. It is not just uh, Nigeria, Mm -hmm. and it's not just uh, southern uh, Africa as well. I hear you. Well, uh, a reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa to participate in our discussion. Please call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code is 1. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. Former Senegalese President Abdou Diouf conceded defeat after losing the 2000 presidential election to Abdoulaye Wade. In Malawi, Hastings Banda served as Africa's longest ruling dictator from July 1966 to May of 1994. But after international pressure, Bakili Mulusi ran against Banda, defeating him in the country's first multi-party election, ending his 33-year rule. Kenneth Kaunda served as the founding president of Zambia from 1964 to 1991. He surprised the world by stepping down in 1991 for Frederick Chiluba, the leader of the movement for multi-party democracy. Aden Abdullah Osman Dar, popularly known as Aden Ade, was Somalia's first president, serving from 1960 to 1967. In 1967, he was defeated by Abdi Rashid Ali Shomarki. Dar accepted the loss graciously, making history as the first head of state in Africa to peacefully hand over power to a democratically elected successor. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizui. And we have to go back, of course, to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good evening, somewhere from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, how are you after a long time? I am hugely Dugu. I can't believe that I can, in fact, Listen to your beautiful voice from Barara near Ruti there in southwestern Uganda. Hello? Yes. Sure, sure. It is me, Samuel. What is your question, I Samuel? I logistics. That's why I could not get in touch with you. But I'm glad that you're back on air. What is your question, Samuel? Time happens not to be our best ally. 
My question goes to uh, uh, Mr. Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. It's about the voters register. Some sub-Saharan African countries, they, they use registers that are completely infested with ghost voters. And they don't comply with the international regulation of cleaning the voters register. What, what, can, we, what can we take on the international observers who only co confine themselves to urban centers and they don't go to rural areas to, to supervise the elections. What is your take, Mr. John Carson? Very, Thank you, Shaka. Very interesting, Samuel. It seems to me that uh, at least your question is very consistent. Over the years, he's been actually repeatedly asking the same question, but I might also add on to it that uh, where he is calling from, there is a president, Yoweri Kagutam Seveni, who is now in his 29th year, a man who came to power and said, the problems of Africa is not about Africans. It is about African leaders who overstay in power. He's also a man who is credited for having unambiguously stated that he cannot be removed from power with a piece of paper. What do you do with that kind of situation, really? How do you expect a country like Uganda to learn from Abuja now? Let me make three quick points in response to the caller and to uh, your uh, comments, uh, Shaka. Uh, the first one with respect to the uh, voter uh, registration. Mm -hmm. uh, voter registry sh should always uh, be updated, and it should be uh, a thorough and comprehensive process that is ongoing up through uh, elections. And when those voter registers are not updated, I think that citizens and citizen organizations ought to be able to take the local election commissions to court to ensure that these registries are updated uh, and seek uh, to do this through a legal and a court uh, process. Mm -hmm. It's important that the registries be updated and that they be thorough. The second point is, is that uh, the, the caller uh, suggested that international uh, observers uh, were supervisors. International uh, observers are simply that. They are observing the process. Mm -hmm. They are not managing the process. They are not organizing the process. They are not supervising or overseeing it. They are simply uh, observing it and making judgments on how they see the integrity of the process. So, and, it, and that's something that is important and more important for civil society groups, uh, domestic groups to do uh, in country. And I think increasingly where there are strong democracies, there is strong civil society participation mm -hmm. and strong civil society uh, observation. In the case of uh, President Museveni and his uh, term, uh, uh, terms in, in, in office, Indeed, it was regrettable uh, a decade or so ago when term limits uh, were, uh, in fact, removed from the Ugandan constitution. Term limits uh, on uh, presidencies uh, in Africa uh, have, in fact, been a good thing and a useful thing, allowing for new leadership to come in with new ideas and for people to be able uh, to know that there are a variety of candidates uh, to whom they can uh, turn to for leadership. Uh, Uganda also has a provision, a age provision uh, for uh, its uh, president. Uh, president Museveni is moving towards uh, that uh, age uh, provision and we will see whether he in fact honors uh, the constitutional aspects uh, that are still uh, on the books. I'm sure you know that uh, there, is, uh, already, uh, there is already, in fact, uh, a process underway to try and uh, also do something about that. Let's again stay in Uganda. Good evening, Dennis. Uh, you're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Saka and uh, Terrific. How are you today, Dennis? In Uganda, it's quite okay. I am terrific. Where are you calling from? In Uganda. I am calling from Iraq, specifically in northern Uganda. I see, I see. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of friends there. Uh, how are you? And what is your question, Dennis? 
I have uh, some two small questions for Carson, the former U.S. ambassador in charge Africa. There is no time for that. Could you please ask one question within the next 30 minutes, if you, 30 seconds, if you don't okay, mind? Okay, I, I, I was kind of asking what the scope of uh, what does uh, the U.S. ambassador uh, do in, in Africa, and because in the context of this Uganda, where they could be having regret where we have two parliaments, there is what they call the caucus and what they call the national parliament. Whatever the country wants, it, 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 it must be determined by the president, then it should be taken to the caucus, so that the parliament becomes a rubber stamp. Whatever is predetermined in the caucus is on the, uh, is only predetermined, is, is only determined in our parliament. Does Kaiser has any regret Thank you. for the issue of stability in whatever has happened? Thank you. Thank you, sir. What about that, uh, Mr. Let me, let, let me just you say, that seconds, the, the Ugandan parliament uh, is a very strong uh, and effective parliament, and it shows uh, a great deal of independence uh, from the executive. Uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, speaker is uh, Madam uh, Rebecca Kadaga, uh, and she has, over the last two or three years, taken a number of parliamentary decisions and acts uh, that uh, show uh, independence uh, from the executive. Mm -hmm. One of the stronger institutions uh, in uh, Uganda uh, is uh, the parliament, uh, as is the judiciary. We hope that they will continue to grow uh, in their independence uh, and in their strength. Obviously, the 2005 Ugandan parliament uh, did not seem to meet that kind of threshold because each member was bribed about $3,000 by President Museveni, which he calls the fiscal facilitation for changing the constitution. What about you, Chris? Uh, I mean, you've been listening here. You've heard about yeah. things like constitutions, uh, which some people, frankly, in some countries, including yours perhaps, call personal manifestos, really. Uh, I what do you think needs to be done so that at least, frankly, people can stop playing with these important documents. Should, no. they, should they take steps like they have taken against military coups, for example? Well, the, I should say that the African Union has um, good instruments on the books, in, on paper, uh, including the Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance that was adopted in 2007 and has now been ratified by enough countries to become the rule of law mm -hmm. across the continent. And this charter also makes reference to the fact that incumbent presidents should not change the constitutions of their countries to perpetuate themselves in power. Mm -hmm. I think the African Union needs to step forward and to listen to the voice of the next generation of Africans who are saying we want to be governed differently, we want constitutions to be respected in our countries, because that's the only way that you can renew political leadership, but you can also guarantee peace and stability for the long haul. But the AU has teeth that do not bite because it has no sovereign powers, except, the last time I checked. Yeah, except that when, when Nigeria, when countries such as Nigeria behave the way they've behaved, a strong message comes out of Nigeria that countries or leaders can no longer ignore. Let's not forget what happened in Burkina Faso just six months ago when people rose up and said, we want the constitution of our country to be respected. And even a military leader who had been in power for 27 years couldn't hold them. Unfortunately, so there's potential time, and we have to build on it. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally, Chris. On that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Ambassador John A. Carson, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, and Dr. Christopher Fomigno. Senior Associate and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute. Thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next, and tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not beta Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.